Hello and welcome back. Eddie Radosovich, George Stoy here for the Soonerscoop.com studios. Josh McQuestion in the Soonerscoop HQ headquarters in Houston. Good afternoon to you, Josh. Uh, as the world turns, Oklahoma is still looking for an offense coordinator. And the news comes out Monday morning that they have lost a 2024 commitment. Dozy Ezukama, the wide receiver out of Fort Worth. Uh, you know, I, I think that... For me, this was one of those names that I remember because how we got his offer. He came, he camped at Oklahoma. Uh, obviously, was very impressive the days that we saw him, Josh. But, uh, you know, in light of the Jeff Levy news as he's headed to Mississippi State to take over the uh, Bulldog program, uh, you knew that there was going to be some decommitments. And maybe this is not something that is, you know, as much connected to Jeff Levy leaving as much as it is just an opportunity to get out of the uh, the commitment. Just kind of your overall thoughts. Was it a surprise to you uh, to find out Monday morning that Dozy had decommitted from the 2024 class? I would say that it was because largely, I mean, and Eddie, you know, you talk about going back to summer camp, you know, our kind of first introduction to Dozy. So much of that was built on him even coming at all was built on his relationship with Emmett Jones that had existed because – you know, for those that don't know, Dozy had been committed to Texas Tech where his brother Eric had played under Emmett. So, like, the, there was – the whole connection to Oklahoma was via Emmett Jones. And, you know, we, we can talk about that situation here in a little bit, but as long as Emmett's solid, you kind of thought, you know, it, it's going to be fine with OU and Dozy. He was not one of the guys that was really on my radar as a, you know, as a possible decommitment, but – when I spoke with him last night and I was kind of working, I was talking to some of the guys and I was working on the scoop that's, you know, that's up on the board or up on the side as well. And I, he, he did, he sounded off. Like he sounded more concerned than any of the other guys I talked to, even the quarterbacks, you know, Michael Hawkins, Brendan Zerbra, Kevin Sperry have all sounded very solid. Dozy. It just sounded like, yeah, you know, kind of disappointed about that. Had really developed a relationship with Levy, really liked him. And you hear that from all these guys. I mean, like, you know, we can't overstate his role as a recruiter. Jeff Levy's a really good one. And I think um, I think that was a, a very real concern for Dozy. So I am a little surprised, but based on the conversation he and I were having last night, and frankly, I expect, I told you guys uh, when that news kind of broke, I was kind of planning to run something this morning based on that conversation, kind of say, hey, let's keep an eye on Dozy as a comma here. But obviously, he beat me to the punch. Josh, I know you you put up something on the board uh, and on Soonerscoop.com talking to several guys about Jeff Levy's departure. Is, are there any other guys? Would you be surprised? I mean, I'm not saying who you might say uh, could mm -hmm. decommit, but would you be surprised if there's maybe a couple others that decommit because of this? You know, surprise. George, surprise is such the trap word because like, <laughs> I know. It, it, with this stuff, you never – like you're just like you anything could up? happen. It, it <laughs> wouldn't be – a yeah, George is trying to catch me in a trap. But uh, no, I I don't think anything is coming. But to say I'd be surprised, no, I mean, we've just done this too long. Like I, yeah. I, I'm – again, dozy. If you would have told me yesterday it was going to be dozy, I would not have – I wouldn't have that on the bingo card. Like that just doesn't – that's something that surprises me. And I think there's plenty of reason to think Oklahoma can get him back in the fold. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm still having conversations, still checking with some people uh, at, at this moment, kind of what the plan is moving forward with him. So um, I, there's no one, though, that sends up an immediate red flag. Like, I know uh, one guy that I think is interesting, just because I remember talking to both him and his head coach about who had such a big role in his recruitment, it's that Zion Raggins, the uh, wide receiver from Georgia that's got the big-time speed. Uh, obviously also being a Southeastern guy, would he have some interest in maybe going, you know, to Mississippi state? And I'm not saying many guys are going to pick Mississippi state over Oklahoma. And I doubt it's the case for Zion, but it's something you wonder about a little closer to home, a little more familiar area. You know, some of those things that you wonder, but he's really the only one that kind of, I, I basically a, he hasn't said much and B, I haven't heard anything directly from him. So We'll have to kind of see what that that plays out. But he's a guy that I would say, I guess it's at least open-ended. A lot of these guys have come out and said, no, I'm good, I'm set, that kind of thing. He's one of the ones that I haven't seen much from so far. I, I would say, too, I'm sure some of this, Josh, is some of them want to wait and see who OU hires. Uh, you know, that's probably a large part of their thought process. I don't know why they, they wouldn't at least uh, think about some of that. I mean, who knows who Oklahoma could – I mean, it could be somebody internal, like we said, which would probably make it – a little bit easier maybe it's somebody 
um, external. So I'm sure that's that's part of their thought process. Well, and, and George, that leads to the question because, like I said, you've had so many of these guys come out and say, "No, we're good." You know, yeah. Michael Hawkins tweeted out this morning, you know, the lock, you know, that kind of thing, and acted like everything was all good. And so it's a question of like, do these guys know something we don't know? And I don't think so. I mean, you know, we we can get into that in a little bit. But I don't get the impression there's anything that's just decided and it's over or anything like that. So I don't think that these guys can be told anything definitive. And as such, I don't know how they can be so certain, unless it's just about what we think it is. They trust Brent Venables, like they they believe in that method and that you know and and his his program, his staff, you know what he's built for himself over the last two years. So I think that is a big part of it. And guys, again, this is. You know, I, I've been honest that there are some things about the way Venables and the way they do, they handle their recruiting, the things they believe in. I think there are some things that are valid holes, but at the same time, I will say because of the way they handle things, they can weather these kind of storms really well because they are really connected to not only the kids, but their families. Like this isn't, there's nothing superficial about this. These are people that if they need to get a hold of them, they know they're going to pick up the phone and, you know, the, the player is going to answer as well. A ton of transparency. And, you know, one thing I, w- I do want to say in connection with Dozie Azucama and, you know, kind of the, the whatever it is with the staff right now on the offensive side of the ball, would it be accurate to say that we don't believe that there's anything connected with Dozie Azucama's decommitment and the possibility of Emmett Jones leaving Oklahoma after year one. You look at all the guys that are currently committed to the class, both in 2024 as well as 2025. You look at the group and the step that, you know, we think that the wide receiver group took in first year under Emmett Jones. I would expect him to be back in Norman uh, for a second season. Uh, You know, uh, George obviously weigh in on this too, but I mean, for me, I I don't think there's any question. You know, And And I can say, again, based on the conversations I had, Dozy spoke to Emmett last night. So this isn't a deal where he was kind of left out there and he's not sure what's going on. I thought Oklahoma did a very good job. And in my conversations with the players, they did a really good job conveying what information they had to give, you know, whether it's Emmett saying, Hey, this is going to be fine. We're going to be all good. I mean, Dozy even, you know, and I can try to pull up the, the, uh, the conversation, but he said something very much along the lines of, you know, just telling me that it's all good, everything's going to be fine, you know, just very, very calming and not like, hey, you know, I don't know what I'm doing either. So I, I think Oklahoma did a nice job calming those waters. I This may be just a kid that wants to kind of see what's out there because he's made two commitments and just really with both of those was kind of locked into the school he was locked in on until – he made that switch from Texas Tech to Oklahoma. So this may just be a guy that kind of at the last minute wants to look around a little bit. I'm still digging on that well, and, a, and, a little bit at this point. And who knows, you know, what's kind of happening behind closed doors, maybe. And this is just completely conjecture on my part. Maybe this means that uh, somebody like a Jalil Farouk has already told Oklahoma, hey, I'm coming back, you know, regardless of who the offense coordinator is going to be. And you start looking at numbers and how everything's going to work out, you know, for you once you get to campus. And, you know, I, I think that, it probably it it definitely coincided with the uh, you know departure of Jeff Labby, but maybe this was just the easiest point to do it. Maybe this is something that Dozy had been wanting to do here for a while. That's certainly possible because I can definitely say that wasn't. This isn't like Oklahoma pushing Dozy out the door. Sure. I, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday, and we were talking about a different player. And just kind of, hey, you know, is, is Oklahoma going to make a run at this guy or that guy in 2024? And I very much got the impression that they were just kind of going to hold firm on where they were in 2024. So I didn't get the impression anything was headed out. I didn't get the impression anybody was coming in. They were just going to be set with their five. And I think at this point, like I said, I think Emmett Jones is going to work to get Dozy back in. I don't think there's anybody that can come close to the relationship that Emmett has with Dozy and his family. So it would be pretty surprising to me if it doesn't end up in Oklahoma's favor. But again, that that word will get you every time. So, I mean, you don't want to rule anything out, but I, I definitely, I like Oklahoma's chances should they continue to pursue him like I think they will. It's interesting. I, I think that, you know, nowadays when you think about a decommitment, you don't think about, uh, you know, everything else and, and maybe somebody coming back to the school that they decommitted from. Uh, that certainly seems to be the case in that regard. All right, let's get into a little bit of uh, some of the high school games that you went to over the course of the last weekend, the playoffs in full swing down in the uh, 
state of Texas, down in the DFW area, as well as down at Houston. You did have a chance to go see 2026 running back target JV and Osborne. And as uh, you know, we rolled the tape here shortly, uh, he had a really damn good game from what uh, it looked like. Yeah, I believe the final total was like 25 for 165 and four touchdowns. And I think, I want to say this is the opening, like this second cut carry of the game that you're watching right here. Busts through some tackles and then just runs through Richland all the way to the end zone. Now, and I want to say this Richland team he's playing, they were 12 and 0 coming into this game and had, you know, were good. They've got Michael Turner, a 2025 running back that I'm sure we'll talk about that OU has an offer out to as well. So there's plenty of talent. And they, they, what I think was most impressive about Osborne is a young back. He was a guy that didn't. Really, had, he popped that first big run that we just saw. And then from there, it was really kind of tough sledding through the second and third quarters, especially because Forney was really throwing the ball well and they weren't going to him a lot. They were finding just a lot of big plays in the passing game. And so he just kind of bided his time. And then by the fourth quarter, Richland, you could see him starting to tire. They were starting to, you know, press a little bit because they knew they were in trouble. They were a couple scores down. And that's when he really started to take off. This run right here was in the fourth quarter uh, that you're looking at him celebrating as he goes in. So uh, not the biggest guy, probably 5'9", 5'10", about 175, 180. But he's a tough runner. You can watch him over and over again. He's breaking through tackles. He's fighting off, you know, defenders. He's um, – I, I was very impressed with Javion Osborne. The, the entire running back situation is really kind of interesting, and particularly going into – you know, the transfer portal season, we're going to see if, you know, anybody from Oklahoma goes, how active they are in the portal themselves. If that were to happen, if you were to lose, you know, somebody out of that that uh, room right now on campus. And then, you know, the Javante Barnes thing was so interesting all season, not to mention the trio of running backs that you have coming in, uh, you know, in, in 2024 in Taylor Tatum, the number one running back in the country, and two guys that are playing for state championships in the state of Oklahoma coming up this weekend. It's just, it's fascinating, Then, not to mention somebody like a Javion Osborne that uh, is just a jun- or a sophomore in high school, which is kind of insane to think about when you look at his tape. Yeah, and, you know, I, I want to give Eddie his love because he always says three, and it makes me pause, and I'm like, who am I forgetting? And I, I know there's a reason Eddie remembers Andy Bass every time, and I don't... Well, we don't celebrate like the Heritage Hall catalog on this program. What I know that you do, Eddie. I know that you do, and that's important. Uh, but no, you know, and, and and Andy, you know, we talk about walk-ons and how it's different. There are certain walk-ons that are different. Andy, Andy Bass is a preferred walk-on that we know Oklahoma did a lot to recruit. This isn't just a guy that's that's coming in and, you know, going to pay his way. Like, Oklahoma's doing plenty to take care of Andy Bass as well. So I think there is um, there's a reason for that. But, yeah, I'm, Oklahoma's running back room has a chance to be in really good shape. At the same time, Gavin Soljuk's the only guy that's going into next year. You say, okay, I feel sure. pretty good about that situation. So guys like Taylor Tatum, guys like Xavier Robinson, you, you're like, it's there. Like, if you want to go and seize the opportunity, there is opportunity there. And I think – Whatever else you you can say about Demarco Murray, he's not been shy about playing young guys if he feels like they can do it. I mean, Barnes played a lot last year. Sawchuck played a lot last year. Uh, I thought as the year went on, I think in some of those games if they could have created some separation, I think it's pretty clear they'd have liked to have gotten more of Dalen Smothers on the field if if they sure. could have made that possible. Josh, I know this is a long ways away. Twenty twenty six makes me feel like I'm actually getting a little bit older. Welcome to the club, George. Um, but it only gets worse from here on out. Uh, one running back in twenty twenty six, Caden Jones. I know Oklahoma's obviously interested in him down at Jinx. I'm guessing this has. I mean, this is just Demarco. Uh, you know, he's taken three running backs this year. We'll see how many he takes in twenty twenty five. I'm assuming this has no effect on what they like about Caden Jones, who... A pair of touchdowns last week. Yeah, about to play in the state championship for Jinx. In the semifinals Pittsburgh. against Union. Come from behind victory. They're down 21 to nothing. Unbelievable comeback. Yeah, I don't know who is more excited about that, Caden or Key, but, uh, you know, <laughs> there, there's no doubt. Uh, and, George, you talk about feeling old. Like, seeing Kiwan the dad is just a wild revelation in my life. No, you know, K- Kiwan and I were in school together. So that that's just a weird, weird thing to acknowledge. Um, but anyway, yeah, you know, with Caden, no, th- there's no relationship there. I mean, I, I think, honestly, I think if Oklahoma could take two backs, those would probably be the two they would take. I mean, yeah. I think that's what you'd like to do. Osborne's a big time guy, got a chance to be the number one back in Texas his senior year. 
Uh, I think Caden Jones is in what is starting to emerge as a pretty good 2026 class in Oklahoma with Adam Austin, the kid from Lawton Mac. I mean, guys, we're going to have to go to Lawton and cover some football. Eddie, that used to be an annual thing for no us. Kidding, and now right? it's been a few years, but now there's some Lawton guys that are starting to pop up and playing pretty good ball. Uh, obviously Javon Harris over at Ike's got it going a little bit too. So, um, there is, uh, I, I think those two are clearly the guys to watch in that 2026 running back class. And I, I know people will feel like George and say, oh, that's so far off and it's so early. I mean, guys, let's just be honest. I mean, that's that's where recruiting's going. Oklahoma, there's a very real possibility. Oklahoma's a third away through their 2025 class already. I mean, not even at the halfway point of those guys' junior year. So, recruiting is just getting faster and faster and faster because of all the stuff we talk about with NIL and the transfer portal and all these things, spots are more limited than they've ever been before. I was actually talking to uh, a head coach in the Oklahoma city area today. And, you know, they kind of want to get an education thing going for some of their guys on, you know, what, what the numbers look like for some of these schools and how different it is compared to what it was five years ago, 10 years ago with uh, how you handle that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I know 2026 seems really far off, but it, it is something people need to be focused on already. Which makes it even more insane that a school like Colorado, for instance, with the back-to-back decommitments in the 2024 and 2025 classes at the quarterback position, I think they're down. I, did I see right there down to eight high school commitments in the 2024 class, which is just in knowing what they have to do to rebuild that program. It's a little bit insane and it's a little bit crazy that they're just going to rely on the transfer portal that much. Uh, it's nuts. I mean, and, and guys, I think it, there's two things to that. Apparently, the the quarterbacks for Colorado aren't as excited to play for Pat Shermer as they might have been for Sean Lewis. So sure. I think that says a lot about that decision being good, made. Good friend, Certainly. Pat Shermer, St. Louis Rams coach. Ate dinner with him. No big okay. Deal. Okay. I, yeah, I, I don't know the man personally, but I don't either. I got to say the I track do. record He was not at the same me. table as me. I, uh, I covered him in Denver when he got fired as the offensive coordinator. Good. Not, okay. a, not, a, not so. the nicest guy. Well, that's oh, my good okay. friend Pat that you're talking about, and you need to well, watch him out. W- what's fun is everybody can watch in this three box and see if Eddie reaches across to, you know, flick George's ear or do something violent. We can just kind of watch it happen out of shot. It'd be so, hard to uh, do with my no. hand on his hip right now. <laughs> hand check but uh no it, it is um and, and again I, I this leads to this idea that i that i've had for a while that i think the plan for dion in colorado was always two years yeah. get shadur and get travis out of there and hopefully you put up you know because guys let's be honest if he goes eight and four at colorado next year i don't care if it's in the big 12 or wherever it is he's gonna have other opportunities probably better than colorado and then he can kind of move on to the next one and, as they say, kind of start the clock over somewhere else. This isn't a Colorado uh, YouTube show any, uh, <laughs> for the entire way, but I, I, do you think he would have had more opportunities had they won eight games this year? If they would have been able to get bowling, just maybe even get to six, you think there would have been more opportunity out there for uh, Dion? Or is it I think he solely... would have been insufferable. Yeah. Oh. Because you know 100%. it would have been – not only his promotion, which again, I, I kind of like that. We need some coaches like that. You need some, some, I don't, I don't know if Dion's a heel, but he's real close to it. You yeah. know, that, that kind of deal. Well, he definitely encourages but at the, But he could have said, oh, I could have gone anywhere. I turned down these jobs. So you turn down the jobs because you've got a quarterback and you've got a generational talent at wide receiver and corner and you can build from there. No doubt but about it. I, that that ain't that that bell's going to stop ringing next year. So I think there again. I think he knows for Shadur and Travis to have the kind of year that he needs them to have to go the places he needs to go to do whatever's going to happen in his career. He's that's not going to he's not going to recruit like that. So he's going to go to the portal. And there's a part of me that thinks, boy, they haven't done much in recruiting. Has he been working behind the scenes this whole time and setting up some moves here and kind of seeing what happens? But you know, we'll we'll know in a week. I mean, like sure. it, it it won't take long if he's really doing the things that we've seen him do on on various occasions. I, I it'll pop up pretty quick over the next ten days. I swear to God, this is the last question about Deion Sanders. Houston did a better job than Colorado. 
with the money that Tilmer Fertitta has injected into the program, you're already going into the Big 12. That I don't know. That just popped up in my brain. Maybe that is something uh, to get back into the state of Texas. I do think, yep. though, that with the Shadur Sanders and uh, Travis Hunter situation, it makes it a little bit more interesting because I don't think that they could transfer all of a sudden and end up at Houston, and I don't think he's going to leave them in Boulder. No, I, I, I think Houston is a better job. I think because largely – Guys, even knowing that you're not going to beat OU, A&M, LSU, you're not going to, you know, Texas, you're not going to beat those schools in Houston for players, even with you getting the second tier choices, the second tier in Houston can win a lot of games oh, sure. in the Big 12. Like the, So I, I think, and Dion could just set up a, a perimeter around the city and say, hey, we're only leaving Houston or the Houston-Dallas, you know, the 45 corridor unless there's somebody special, like we don't need to. And the way he would draw, I, I, I think, I think he'd be a dangerous fit for the big 12 at Houston. He, he'd be pretty good. And especially he and Fertitta playing off each other, that would be pretty funny to watch. And now I think it would, it would eventually end up in utter flames, but it would be fun while they were going. Yeah. I don't know. You might, have, you maybe sold me on that. Uh, to the Prosper <laughs> North Crawley game was something that you hit on Friday mm -hmm. night, a name that we've talked about right here on the Soonerscoop.com YouTube page, and that is a Prosper offensive lineman, 2024. I believe he plays center guard for Prosper, Tyler Mercer. He is currently committed to Tulane, Josh. Um, where is OU in kind of that pursuit of Tyler Mercer, the uh, big man number 76 for Prosper? I think it just remains very much a situation that the ball is in Oklahoma's court. And, and we've talked about – you know, I talked about it last week where I kind of thought once the Grant Brick situation played out that Oklahoma was just going to move on Tyler Mercer. Clearly, that hasn't happened. I'm starting to wonder a little bit if he could be a situation kind of like Andy Bass where Oklahoma wants to bring him in as – you know, he's for those that don't know, he's a current two-lane commitment, a good player. I really liked what I saw, and we can get into that a little bit if we want to. I, I think he's a quality guy. For those watching him and saying, okay, he's really having to fight this zero – Zero is Sterling Brooks, who is a 6'1", 320-pound TCU commitment that is just a brick in the middle of that defensive line for North Crowley. So the fact that Tyler Mercer is having to fight, that's okay. I don't have any problem with that. For those also wondering, 70 is Connor Cardi, the 2025 offensive lineman for Prosper that uh, that Oklahoma offered on the um, – uh, the West, not the West Virginia weekend. Um, yes, the West Virginia weekend. I'm sorry. But, yeah, so there is um, – there's again I like Tyler Mercer I think he shows kind of that center savvy that you see sometimes like just a guy that he gets it he's gonna he's gonna hold you a little bit here he's gonna pull on you a little bit there he he's he's gonna fight for every little inch he can get and to me those are the really good centers I mean guys we've all heard Gabe Eichard talk about it and just the way you know like almost like when he'll talk about Andrew Ray he's like I wish he'd cheat a little bit more and like that and it's and that's that's what Tyler Mercer has some of. There is some ability to fight through even when he's getting beat. Like, I can find a way to slow you down enough for a play to go through. He seems like the perfect size for a center, too. 6'4", 275. I know we've talked about that before. I mean, could you see him playing guard at all, or, or is his future definitely at center? Oh, I think he's very much an Everett type of guy, like where yeah. you just look at him and say he's a center. Like, that. that's just – he's. Uh, it's not even that he's – he's not – you know, big enough. Cause I'd say he's, you know, I think he's lifted at six, four, two seventy five, but he's probably more like six, two and a half, six, three. I mean, yeah. he's big enough, but he's not, he's not enormous or anything like that. Um, but I, I don't think he's got the base to play guard. Like he's not gonna, you know, you watch Caden green walk out on the field and you're like, dad gum like that. That's a, that's a dude. And not that everybody's going to be compared to a guy like Caden green. That's, that's just going to be wildly unfair. But I just don't think he's a guy that, you know, like in a bull rush situation is going to set his butt down against Tavondre Sweat and have a chance. Like, it, that's going to be a problem. He's going to need to chip, and you're going to want him to work out to linebackers. And you wonder if they would use – because he's an athletic guy. You wonder if they would get back to some of the stuff that they did with, like, Creed, you know, a lot where they'd have the center pulling around. Like, they did some more action like that. And I think he's that kind of ability, and I think he's that kind of smart. Like, I think he gets the position and reads it well. I have been handed a note. Our own Kerry Murdoch. They knew each other. That's what a small world. 
I've been eliminated. <laughs> That's, it's an incredible development that we will need to follow up on on this week's Unofficial 40. So you'll need to listen to the Unofficial 40 this week to hear the great Carrie Murdoch explain. Uh, somebody else that we did uh, see, North Crawley High School. That's who Prosper was playing. North Crawley knocks Prosper out of the Texas High School State playoffs. But uh, John Turntine, another 2026 offensive lineman, as well as Jonathan Cunningham, a 2025 linebacker from North Crawley, a very talented North Crawley football team. Yeah, uh, Cunningham's a guy that you look at, and he's about 6'2", 185, 190, play some linebacker, you know, play will drop into coverage, very natural. He, I mean, guys, it's not coincidence. The guys that we keep finding are like, that's a cheetah. That's a yeah. cheetah. That's like, there's so many guys they keep finding because, and it's, it's understandable because they're these big, long athletic guys that can really run. You're like, yep, those guys work on a defense. You can find a way to make those kind of guys fit into your system. So, um, I, I was impressed with him. He doesn't currently hold an Oklahoma offer. I wouldn't be at all surprised if that happens uh, down, you know, kind of down the road. Now, what I will say is what may make that tricky for him is Oklahoma already has Marcus James, who they see as that cheetah role. So maybe they just say, okay, you know, like we really like you, but we've got our guy. We feel good about it. You know, they, they kind of keep that Carl Albert uh, pipeline happy and and kind of going. Uh, John Turntine was a guy that was actually at the um, – the West Virginia, uh, excuse me, the UCF game and talked about how much he's liked his interactions with Bill Biedenboe, uh, was also at the Red River rivalry. So he's seen Oklahoma several times as a guy that I really, I wasn't aware of how serious he was about Oklahoma yet. But like I said, already coming to Norman, uh, you know, fall, I saw, I saw OU at two out of three weeks in October. So I think that's a pretty good sign of where things are with him and OU, um, you know, and, and obviously being a 2026 guy, for those that don't know, there can't, you know, Bill Biedenboe can't pick up the phone and call him. He can't, there, there's a lot of limitations. Um, he can't, he can't even DM with him. Like there's, it's a very limited deal until next uh, August 1st. On August 1st, 2024, then you can start talking to the then junior class um, as they begin their junior high school season. So that that's always kind of when you really start to figure out who's who and who's the focus and that kind of stuff. And again, that's why you've seen, as we mentioned earlier, Oklahoma's 2025 class kind of explode because they were able to really identify, okay, these are our guys, these are our key targets. And they could start to really put that full court press towards some of these guys. And some of them clearly were close to making a decision. And then since then have. Very good. As you said, it seems like the 2024 class, it's been – Outside of the Dozy Azucama decommitment, uh, there's been good returns, I think, on the Jeff Levy situation. I'm interested to see what happens with 2025. You mentioned Carl Albert and the pipelines, the pipeline that is out there. Uh, you know, I think you got to start with Kevin Spare, the 2025 uh, quarterback commitment, and uh, you know, it's it's just going to be kind of interesting to see if uh, I think one of the reasons and one of the reasons that he moved to Oklahoma, for God's sake, was Jeff Levy, and now. You know, Levy's obviously headed to Starkville, and it's going to be interesting to see kind of how that whole thing kind of comes together. Do you guys have any just general thoughts on uh, the 2025 class and where everything is at with the departure of Jeff Levy? For me, and, and I'll like I said, I feel like George hadn't gotten a chance to like talk about anything. George has just been sitting over there very calmly and nicely. He looks and cute today. Dealing though. with that, I do look good today. Yeah, the hair. It's it's the hair with the with the yeah. uh, product. There, a lot George. of product. <laughs> zero product but uh but now you know with 2025 I, I think it's in really good shape i haven't talked to anybody that's a big concern kevin sperry obviously he's gonna want some answers he's got a lot of time to think through his decision obviously as well put a lot forward you know to make the move to the oklahoma city area and you know that was kind of their plan anyway so uh, i i don't know how much to put into that? Obviously, Jeff Levy is a big part of that. And I, again, I can't say enough about his ability as a recruiter, but as at a position like quarterback where he is specifically the guy, the point man, I think he's just done a great job. And there, there is some real connection there. But at the same time, I, guys, nobody is picking – Mississippi State over Oklahoma. Like that, that's not a thing. I don't care if Jeff Levy's there or he's not there. If if the kids from Mississippi OU or Mississippi State might have a fighting chance against OU, there is almost no other scenario that I can come up with. 
And then you add in with Kevin Sperry that not only is he now an Oklahoma player, but has multiple teammates who are committed to OU and saying, hey, you know, we're, we're good, man. This is going to be fine. Give it time. I, I would just expect Kevin to take a little bit of a, you know, just a breath and kind of see what happens, see who they hire. Uh, obviously, he will know Seth Luttrell and have some relationship there. So I, I think that can cure a lot of it. And then if the Oklahoma does go outside, you know, the, the walls and kind of make a decision uh, from a, a more national search, I, I don't. There, there's no reason that it shouldn't be a guy that could get him back in the boat and make. And I, it's not to say that he's decommitted or anything like that. Just make him feel good and kind of get him back to where he was before. I guess yesterday morning. We're not even 24 hours, um, you know, outside of the Jeff Levy news breaking, George. And you are you put the hot board up on Sudorscoop.com last night. Uh, as we, this is the second time that we're talking about the Jeff Levy stuff following last night's kind of emergency, uh, you know, if you will, emergency instant reaction to the Jeff Levy news. Any more thoughts just now that we're oh, basically, you know, 16 hours into a uh, quote unquote Oklahoma offensive coordinator search had your thoughts on, uh, you know, kind of what direction or where they're headed uh, changed here over the course of the last couple hours? Well, I do think they're going to do an external search. I know we've talked a lot about Seth Luttrell and, and him being, you know, probably the still the front runner candidate. And, and obviously he's an internal candidate. Uh, I think Joe John Finley is another name uh, internally that they will consider. But I know that they're doing their due diligence in terms of exploring their options outside of Oklahoma. Uh, and let's be honest, they should. Uh, this is an incredibly enticing job, I think, across the country. You know, I put it out last night. Since 1999, every single off OU offensive coordinator has gone on to be a head coach somewhere. Uh, and only one of them was fired, and that was Josh Heupel. And it still worked out pretty damn well for him. So I do think Oklahoma is going to look around. Uh, we'll see, uh, you know, who those people are. I did want to mention on the Kevin Sperry stuff, I know that uh, him and his family are, um, you know, going through the thought process of everything that's going on. I think they're waiting to see what exactly happens. Uh, you know, I think he's pretty set and committed to Oklahoma. But, you know, again, you want to see who they end up hiring. And, and if you have a relationship with that person at offensive coordinator, I think, you know, he obviously knows Seth Luttrell. Like we mentioned on the live stream last night, Seth Luttrell was very involved with the quarterbacks during the summer camps when we were out there. Um, you know, so was Matt. Holchek, I think that's how you say his name. Yes. Uh, senior offensive analyst. I think he's going to end up following Levy to Mississippi State. Um, and, and I would just say that he followed Levy from Oxford, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I, I would anticipate he'll end up going to Mississippi State with him, and I wouldn't be shocked if he ends up maybe being the quarterback's coach there at Mississippi State. So, um, you know, he's somebody that I know is also close with, with the Sperry family. Again, I don't think that's going to end up having an impact here, but – um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see who ends up following Lebby. There's been a lot of rumors out there about who that might be. I think it's mostly going to be quality control analyst type uh, staff members that end up going with him. Maybe Joe John. That's the only position coach that you've you've heard the rumblings. Um, but he, Joe John could also end up being a co-offensive coordinator here at Oklahoma. But that's kind of where it's at. I do think that uh, we'll have a clearer picture um, in the next few days uh, as this thing gets ramped up. And I do think, Eddie, you and I were talking about it. Off the air, if it is an internal uh, hire, I wouldn't be shocked if we know in the next 48 to 72 hours uh, who that might be. It would seem that if it's going to be Seth or Joe John or anybody uh, as part of the program right now, uh, it would seem that you'd want to get that done immediately. I don't know. Especially it, with the portal, of, the portal, the portal opening portal up. The portal coming of the stuff. waters. And that's not to say that there's a lot of guys that are thinking about entering the portal right now. I think that there's a lot of guys on the offensive side of the football that – are pretty dead set and happy with where they're at. And, you know, one of those guys and probably the most important guy being Jackson Arnold. Uh, it certainly, there has been no indication that he is looking to leave. In fact, I think it's been even more so a, a doubling down, if you will. Uh, you know, I know that Jackson Arnold's father talked to the OU Daily. That was on Sunday, even before the Jeff Levy news uh, came out. So that's going to be interesting to watch here uh, moving forward. And, you know, just in terms of external names, I know that, uh, there's there's been a number of those names that are out there, uh, whether it be uh, you know the the Grobe, uh, Brian Grobe from uh, Washington or Andy Ludwig from Utah, uh, Brennan Marion from UNLV, who's having a fantastic season under Barry Odom uh, with the Rebel program. They're interesting. It really is interesting, Josh. But I just keep going back to the idea. There is a little bit of something about continuity, and I think that you know especially when you're headed again to the SEC. 
How much do you guys weigh in terms of uh, you know hiring of an offense coordinator, not wanting to be right back where they are right now in a year from now, and then having to make somebody like a Jackson Arnold learn a third different offense in three years? I, I certainly don't think that you want to get to that point, but I also understand the other side of it and saying that would be a good problem to have because that means whoever you had hired had a pretty damn good 2024. Yeah, I mean, let, let's look at what Oklahoma's offense and defense were this year and the fact that I don't think anybody's called for Ted Roof to be their head coach. So, you know, I, you have to just be honest about these things. Like, to me, guys, and, and it's it's one of those things, and I've brought it up on the podcast before, but it's one of those things I remember hearing when I was young, and it stuck with me. When Tulsa basketball got sick of losing all their coaches, Nolan Richardson and Bill Self, and, you know, you go down the list, all these great coaches – and they hired somebody and they're like, and this is a guy that'll stay. Well, that dude got fired because he wasn't good. And I can't even remember. I think it was uh, the Peterson guy, if I remember right. But Buzz it, it was just one of those. No, I, no, no. But I, I, it, I don't know. It doesn't even matter who it was. If you're not hiring guys with the hope that they're going to be taken away from you, then you're doing it wrong. Like, the, the, to me, that is a sign of success. I mean, guys, you look at that first Bob Stoop staff. Mark Mangino, you know, Mike Leach, you know, you go down the list. The reason that team was so good and that staff was so good had a bunch of future head coaches on it, you know? And so I, I think that is, that's something that has value that you have to give credit to. So I, I would agree. Like, I don't love the Cliff Kingsbury idea just as an example. And, you know, I know we were talking about this before we started, before we went on, because I think Cliff would come in, have one good year with Jackson Arnold, and then he's probably gone. And then you are really in that situation, but if you could find another guy, uh, you know, uh, that's on kind of the Jeff Levy trajectory where, okay, a couple good years at a big school like Oklahoma, and he's going to be a head coach somewhere. To me, that's ideal. Like the idea that you're going to have a coordinator, a really good one for three or four years, especially offensively guys, because we know everybody in college football is looking for that next offensive coordinator, that next hot name, that next guy. It's really hard to keep those guys for more than a couple of years because somebody's going to swoop in pay them a lot more money than you can reasonably play a court pay a coordinator and they're going to go be their own guy so go get the guy that's right and something george said before i, I want to lead him into you know whatever he wants to talk about this has to be a great hire a good hire is not good enough like this is oklahoma this is probably the best coordinator job when you look at track record of any availability in the country so you need to go get the right guy not just the easy choice that you know is the low-hanging fruit and I think, Eddie, to your point of uh, you don't want to be back in this position, you can't think like that. Sure. I think you have to think who is the best person for this program. And, and you had an interesting point, too, earlier. Do you hire somebody to win now or do you hire somebody to build the program in a better spot long term? And I, I think that Brent's answer would be what's best for the program long term. And I think that's going out and, and hiring somebody exciting. Uh, you know, try and, and maybe that's Seth Latrell. I don't know. I don't know what those discussions look like. Maybe they really believe in Seth that he is the long term answer. But I think that they should go out and they should have everybody on their list. I mean, I you know, uh, from Will Stein at, at Oregon. I know that name has been brought to my attention of like, what well, could they go after him? I th anybody's on the anybody should be on the table. I think Stein would be really hard to pull away because Oregon's got a lot of great momentum right now. And I think people really believe in Dan Lanning out there. But you know, uh, what about Den Denbrock from LSU? Why not give him a call? Uh, you mentioned Grubb from Washington. Go ahead, give him a call. You know, all these guys, they should be on the table because you are Oklahoma. And so that's what's going to be really interesting, too, to see, you know, do you go after the hot name, the young, sh you know, young gun and, and a Willie Korn at Liberty uh, that maybe doesn't have as much experience, but you think he's going to be the next big name or uh, a Kirby Moore uh, who's done a really good job at Missouri, I know Josh mentioned him. So, do, how much do you weigh experience, uh, you know, like a Seth Latrell has versus maybe a young guy that doesn't have as much experience, but you think is going to be a great coach someday? So, that it's going to be really interesting to see how they handle this. At the end of the day, they're probably going to end up hiring Seth Latrell, and we're all going to be, of course, you know, we we should have seen that coming. But it I, makes a lot of sense. It makes it makes it it makes all the sense to hire Seth Latrell. But I also think that it makes a lot of sense to go out and at least try. Sure. Uh, some of these other names and see what you can come up with a name that we uh, didn't discuss yesterday Scott Frost no I don't I don't think he fits Oklahoma okay. I just but. wanted to throw it out there and see what you guys said and see the based on the stuff face, that Josh. you the stuff that 
you heard about him coming out of Nebraska and kind of the schedule and that kind of thing, I think he'd last about 10 minutes under Brent Venables. Like, I, I don't think that's a good fit at all with some of the stuff you just heard that I don't think that was the tightest ship you ever saw at, at Nebraska. Um, now, the the thing I will say that I, I kind of keep coming back to, and it, it's uh, I heard Gabe talk about it, but it's a conversation I had with somebody else as well yesterday afternoon. Guys, there's a lot to consider with what Jeff Lebby meant to Oklahoma as a recruiter, which I referenced several times earlier, but also guys, the NIL people yep. like that kind of stuff. Jeff had a big hand in that. Like th there was a lot of work he did there that I don't think people saw and recognized. And he, he knew a lot of important people and a lot of important people liked him. I so it, it was who not going to find to do that. It was mm -hmm. not a coincidence, Josh. And I don't know if you saw any of the video last night coming out of Starkville. Uh, the, the shirt that Jeff Levy was wearing, I think it, I forget what their thing is called, but it was like the uh, whatever bulldog initiative or something like that. It was there. It was Mississippi state's NIL collection, which is really strong. And you know, Zach Selman all the way back to his time at Oklahoma, he kind of helped and had a, a helping hand in getting OU's NIL uh, situation kind of righted when I think a lot of people were worried about the direction of that thing. And all of a sudden, you get Jackson Arnold, you get Peyton Bowen, and you know I think everybody kind of knows how they were able to kind of steady those and navigate those waters coming off of a 6-7 and seven season. It wasn't because there's a lot of kids that just love Oklahoma. Sorry. Everybody picks OU. Everybody that picks OU, Eddie, we've established it's because they love well, the they, university. Yeah. Uh, then. They, like they, they, on came, on, they came too. out of the womb singing live on, yeah. you know, so that that's, that's the way that goes. But uh, yeah, it's I mean, point, guys, it, it's, yeah, I mean, it's just something. And, you know, I was talking to somebody this morning that is very familiar with Levy and they were talking about the thing that may be hardest to replicate is the energy he brings. Cause he is a very go, go, go kind of guy, but at the same time, very easy to talk to people find him relatable. And I'm not saying you got to go find Jeff Levy. Cause I, it, uh, you know, it's the easiest thing in the world. Once Jeff Levy leaves that like everything was perfect, you know, like it, it, it wasn't, we know it wasn't, but I do think, um, there is plenty of stuff that you can look at from him and say, that's part of why he was successful. We, you know, Oklahoma should probably try and emulate that. Well, and I think that just from the Mississippi state side of things and, you know, the relationship that we talked about with Zach yesterday and everything that we kind of know about the, uh, the hire now, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense why that was the first move to make George. We were talking about it before we got started here, just in terms of, you know, on the surface, I don't think Mississippi state's a very good job. I think we were pretty upfront about that yesterday. It's an sec job though. And with the backing that they have, uh, maybe you can throw some NIL money at people and all of a sudden, you can flip over that roster, which hasn't, I think somebody was talking about it on the board, they have not recruited just terribly Mississippi State, just in general. I think they have two top 25 classes in back-to-back -back years that Jeff Levy will now inherit. And, and the thing about, because I, I know there's a lot of OU fans who are like, why would Mississippi State hire Jeff Levy? That kind of a job, you either swing for the fences and you get a guy like Mike Leach that they got, obviously, a few years ago. Or you take a big risk and you go and you get a Jeff Lebby who I think the appeal there is, like you guys mentioned, the NIL, being able to recruit. He's going to get talent there. I, I don't doubt that Jeff Lebby can go out and get people to come play for him at Mississippi State. The question that he has to answer is, can he manage a team? Can he manage a program? Can he build it? Because it, it is going to be a tough build. And then what does that success look like at a place like Mississippi State? Is it just being bowl eligible? Is it competing for an SEC championship? That seems a, a little bit unrealistic, but if he can go in there and you know win six, seven games in his first year and start to build that thing up, then maybe he can he can have some some success. But I think Mississippi State's banking on the fact that hey, he knows the NIL game. He's going to be able to recruit. He's going to be able to relate to players, uh, and he's going to hire a good staff because he is pretty well connected in the college football world. Very good. That is uh, Josh. Go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just going to, for a quick perspective. So Mississippi State was 22nd in the country in recruiting with the on three industry last year. That puts them ninth in the SEC. I mean, that, that that's the kind of thing you're talking about. Like, yeah. it it warps the perspective. You're like, oh, they had a top 25 class, they had a good year. In the SEC, man, that's barely bowl eligible. It, it's just brutal. 
that's your new world, Oklahoma fans. Have fun. That's going to do it. Uh, good recruiting report as, uh, you know, things continue to come out here over the next couple of days. It's going to be a really interesting week. Not because Oklahoma's not playing in the Big 12 Championship, but because you're kind of in that bowl period now where Oklahoma's obviously waiting to see what bowl game they're headed to. We'll be back, I think, at some point this week, kind of get a little bit more into, uh, you know, end of the season wrap up. We'll see where Oklahoma's headed to do the bowl situation. We'll see, you know, kind of explore, uh, you know, transfer portal needs because that is right on the horizon as well as uh, early signing period coming up. So it's a good time for Soonerscoop.com. It's a good time to join Soonerscoop.com for $1. You can do that for two months. Uh, promo code OU1. Promo code OU1. And uh, I think we have some other stuff that uh, we could throw at uh, new subscribers that would be uh, quite fun for everybody involved. So, We'll be back here on the Soonerscoop.com YouTube channel. And, of course, if something pops with the offense coordinator situation, we will be uh, you know, right here in studio and ready to jump on and talk about anything and everything that comes with a decision that could be made here. You know, I, I truly, like, it, it's kind of crazy to talk about, but if they'd name somebody in an hour, I'd believe it. Like, I don't yeah. think that anybody would just necessarily be completely shocked if they were to do so. So we shall see. It's going to be interesting. Special thank you to Josh. Thank you to George. And of course, thank you to myself for being here. We'll talk to you next time.